of like, dislike, and neutral. So we can think of our accumulated karma is like the air. Um, we think it's clear air, but it's filled with all of our karmic propensities. We don't, it's too subtle for us to see directly. Um, we don't notice it, but we have taken in layers and layers and layers, essentially of toxins throughout our life. Now, um, we could say from multiple lifetimes, but it's just as easy to say from this life. We can see that we've taken in invisible toxins in our culture, right? So I was really struck when um, I was listening to an interview with um, a psychologist, Jennifer Eberhardt, and she does um, a lot of work on bias. And she was saying that she was on a plane with her four-year-old son. And her four-year-old son looked over and said, Mommy, that man looks just like Daddy. And she goes, oh, yeah. And then, and then the four-year-old said, Mommy, is that man going to rob us? So here was a four-year-old child who, in a loving family, through the culture, had taken in so much toxins, he had fear. Right? And that's what we don't see invisibly that we've taken in all of this without our seeing it or knowing it, and that it subtly affects the like, dislike, neutral. So this like, dislike, neutral, and the way our mind responds and reacts to that is exactly where we can rewind the pattern, unwind the pattern, re reset the pattern. How many, how many people have taken the implicit bias test? Fair number of people. So that test is really, really interesting. And I think, I think it's actually measuring the like, dislike, neutral. Because that is so subtle and so fast we don't see it. So it puts um, sets of faces and um, positive attributions to one face and then the other face, a negative attribution. And then um, it asks you to constantly switch. And it can tell when you hesitate, right? So there are lots of different kinds of faces, and you have to put some in a positive box and then some in a negative box, and then it starts switching back and forth. Um, so what, what it is um, doing is it's timing. So if you see something and you, you have to mentally work with your reaction to put it in a different kind of box because you're feeling like, dislike, or neutral, wants to send it to a like, dislike, or neutral box. You have to think to make it go into a, another box, right? Do those of you who take the test, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, think, I really think that's what it's measuring. So I found that tremendously useful because usually we don't see that and we don't know how to get at it. Um, what we do know how to get at is the thinking part that it was measuring. Um, so that when we slow down our thinking, we can start to see what would happen if we s see there's some impulse of like, dislike, or neutral, and we don't go on to elaborate, right? And um, we used to do this in the monastery all of the time. Um, and it was really helpful because in the monastery, we were meditating so much, our thoughts were way slowed down. So we could actually see um, if we were in a grumpy mood and we passed someone in the hall, we could see that there was a subtle like-dislike response and recognize it for what it was. And that then not to go into, oh, that person's a pain, or they did this, they did that. We could see the, the impulse to want to give rise to elaborations of mind, reactions of mind, and stop it right there. That's why, that's why it's important to, um, to understand this and know this, right? Because it is all in you, on your side. All of these elaborations about classifying, judging, um, and creating reactions. And those reactions create stronger and stronger habits and patterns. And those patterns start to lead to actions. So if you had um, a reaction to a dislike response, 
and you're in a grumpy mood and later we're short with that person, that would be an action that would be creating more karmic seeds. Right? And this has a lot uh, to do with um, also how we can think of ourselves um, as engaged spiritual beings when we're working with um, any kind of uh, justice issue, right? So if we are engaged in some sort of work to help beings who are suffering, if we start getting into, I don't like this, this is wrong, these people are ignorant, these people are wrong, I'm so angry with them, why can't everybody see that it's wrong? Um, we may be trying to do beautiful environmental work, right? Something to save the planet. But we're actually creating in our minds a stronger and stronger pattern of anger. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Which means that, that it will be easier and easier for us to get angry. And if we have a lifetime of commitment to... Um, any kind of uh, work to benefit beings, and we're continuously having uh, uh, responses about um, for and against and opponents, and then uh, building the opponents into um, more and more uh, despicable people. We are doing that with our mind. There is no direct contact. It's in our mind, creating habits and patterns in our mind. That's why this is so important to know. So there's a presentation on the mind and on consciousness that's also very interesting um, that talks about, it's from a um, a perspective that we call the mind only, and I find it really fascinating um, in this uh, development of understanding that the other isn't exactly what we think it is. We have continual responses, but not direct contact with the other. Okay, so this is a teeny tiny piece of saffron, right? So this is a lot of saffron, we can see it. Like we can see, um, <coughs> We can't see all of the toxins in our culture, but we can see lots of them, right? So that's a fairly coarse level, okay? So in this presentation of the mind, there's an extremely subtle level. So there's one piece of saffron in there. So we cannot see that it's actually changed the glass of water, right? Compared to the coarse level of reactive responding mind, um, barely changed. Let me see if I can taste it yet. I can almost taste it. Probably if I left it in a little longer, I could taste it. Okay, from this presentation of mind, and, and the purpose of these presentations of mind is to just open the idea of perhaps it's not a solidified, solidified self and a solidified other. And we go through many different um, philosophical presentations and each one gradually wears away other aspects. So this is the aspect called mind only. And from this aspect, we talk about eight consciousnesses. So they're the, the first six that we've been talking about so far of the senses plus the mind that's classifying and judging and uh, making degrees of um, uh, discernments, okay? Um, from this perspective, there is a very, very subtle level that we call the klesha consciousness. And um, beyond that is something that's called the alaya. So as a karmic seed um, is uh, created, it is stored in the alaya, that's the storehouse consciousness. And when a conscious, and when a karmic seed ripens, it comes from the alaya. And so from this perspective, there's a karmic seed that's ripening and it passes through the klesha consciousness through uh, the 
six consciousnesses and it appears outside as an object. But it's actually a karmic seed that's passed through the six consciousnesses, uh, sorry, the seven consciousness and the six consciousness and the six consciousnesses are reading it as outside. The, the important part of this is the klesha consciousness. The klesha consciousness is an extremely subtle eye that is always there and not uh, discernible. It's not the gross level of thinking, I'm myself, you are other. It's a, an extremely functioning, subtle functioning all the time of I am I, I am actually better. <laughs> Um, probably I'm worth protecting, um, something like that. A subtle, 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 subtle. And these karmic seeds blossom and we see as though it's outside. Filtered through the eye, filtered through all of our karmic propensities to appear uh, to our mind as though it were outside. It's another way of helping us understand that we don't actually experience anything other than our karmic seeds ripening and making judgments and decisions about what we think we're experiencing. All subtly flavored in a way we don't see at all by the um, controlling eye. I love the expressions on your face. <laughs> Subtle disbelief to way, <laughs> way thinking about things. All right. So all of these things are to help us really question what is it we do experience? How is it that the likes, dislikes, and neutrals develop? And how is it that we accept all of our elaborations as though it's a true experience that would be universally true for everyone. All phenomena are preceded by the mind, issue forth from the mind, and consist of the mind. So all of your experiences that we assumed all this time, a direct experience, are indirect. All of our experiences consist of the mind. So this is something that we really work with and meditate with, and you can continue um, sitting with. Uh, now we'll look at it a little bit further from a couple of other perspectives. Okay. You're thinking about your mind. There's self and there's other. <coughs> From your side, there's self and I'm other. From your side, there's yourself and their other, right? Self and other. From our side, it's our self and your other. So another way to approach this is to keep thinking, oh my goodness, self and other are equal. I think self all of you are thinking other, they're actually equal because they're dependently arising phenomena. Mm -hmm. Let's look at that in terms of friend and enemy. If all your friends were in the room, they'd be viewing you as friend. Right? If 
if the people that uh, had a hard time with you were in the room, they'd be viewing you as a problem. If there were people who didn't know you in the room, they would be viewing you as neutral. One of those is not more true than any of the others. They're all equal. They're constructs. Think about how you make the designation. If you have somebody that's a friend, there's that like arising, there's all of the karmic seeds. It could be years and years of karmic seeds of you know wonderful things you've done with each other. And then one day they betray you. All of a sudden, the friend is now an enemy. The same being, yesterday was friend, today is enemy. One is not more true than the other. You're constructing friend or you're constructing enemy. The intrinsic truth is they're a potential Buddha, <laughs> just as you are, <laughs> right? Let's take it one step further. Think of um, someone you think of as a friend. Okay, think of someone you think of as a problem or a difficult person in your life. Consciousness, the mental consciousness, was looking at an image or an isolate, a vague, ephemeral, abstract idea, and simply putting a label friend or a label enemy. The fabric, the essence, the thought nature is exactly the same. It was an ephemeral, abstract image, right? From the, from the perspective of the nature of that thought that arose as friend or as enemy, that you label as friend or as enemy, is an impermanent, fleeting, ephemeral, non-material, non-inherently existing thing. There's no difference in the nature of thought itself. You made all the attributions, right? It's a fleeting, passing moment in your mind. Think of how much suffering we cause ourselves, mm -hmm. that we get into, this happened to me exactly the way I think it happened, and I'm right because this and this and this, they're bad because this and this and this. It's fleeting, ephemeral, indirect, passing moments of mind that you are elaborating into a three-hour movie. Right? 
It's true. And then you watch the same movie a million times. If we're upset about something, we replay the movie over and over and over again. I would not go to a movie that many times. <laughs> I couldn't even imagine any movie I ever liked enough to see that many times as I might replay you know, some hurt moment in my life. So what is actually going on? There is a movement of the mind that we are creating millions of elaborations about. It doesn't mean we haven't had experiences, and it doesn't mean we haven't had painful experiences, but it does mean that we have a choice to create them as though they were a continuing uh, reality in our mind, as opposed to understanding that they are a thought that's moving, impermanent, fleeting, ephemeral. And it's not as though it doesn't take work to unwind um, a very painful thought. The Buddha said to um, move uh, yourself out of anger is to peel your skin away like a snake shedding its skin. So that to me implies painful, difficult work um, to really look and see and understand. So it's not that um, that we don't have work to do and that we haven't had experiences. But when we start to understand the nature of our thoughts, then we can start to question what is the effect of replaying this over and over? Am I creating a habit of pain? Am I creating a habit of depression? If it's not permanent, it means potentially you have a choice, right? And as you get stronger and stronger, you have more of a choice. Let's, let's give it a, an easy try. All right, so um, either recall a plot of a movie or the last time you watched the news and something made you angry. Just call that to mind and see if you can rev it up into an angry feeling. Okay, now think of um, the last time you had a, um, a wonderful feeling of gratitude. Somebody did something lovely for you. the perspective of being confused in samsara, we think of these as two distinct things, right? Two things that actually happened, that we had an experience, um, that we're quite justified in having the feelings that we have about it, and we could probably talk an hour about why we're justified, right? But from the perspective of thought, they're exactly the same. We're sitting here, and you called up a memory, and your sixth consciousness looked at that memory and thought about it. It's still your sixth consciousness working with the memory. It's still that ephemeral capacity of knowing. 
that worked with the difficult thought and the more pleasant thought. They're absolutely equal from that perspective. Just tentatively exploring this can be of great benefit to you. Just testing out the idea to see, might this be possibly true? Because it means we're then not trapped in uh, heavy emotional anger. Because we can start to take ourselves out of it and say, oh, these are my thoughts, they're going in that direction. These are my thoughts, they're going in a different direction. It also means you don't have to take in things. Um, you might say take things to heart. If you know that your ear consciousness is contacting an aural experience, and you go like, dislike, and leave it at that. How dare they call me that? What's the matter with them, right? You don't have to go there. Um, these are some of the practices that we call illusory nature practices. And one of the um, uh, one of the meditation practices is go to um, like a canyon and yell things out, yell insults at yourself, um, so that you hear them back as echoes. And you go, oh, if I understood, it is just sound, and I determine the meaning. And I then make elaborations about the meaning. I can actually allow sound to be sound. Not taken into or not responding and reacting to like and dislike. And from there not creating new habits of anger and from there not acting on the anger. So, um, if we were trying to think of what would a great bodhisattva or a Buddha um, be hearing if somebody was screaming at them? Um, they would be aware that there is sound. There would be no reaction whatsoever. And they would be in the equanimity of loving kindness. So the prayer we say at the beginning, all sentient beings, especially the enemies who hate me, that's the way we start being able to contemplate how we might work with that. If we don't take that fleeting, um, unformed, like, dislike, neutral, um, I know I'm using words for it, but it's before you conceptually make words of like, dislike, neutral. It doesn't get to like and dislike. And that doesn't get further blossoming into attraction and aversion which then goes into anger or desire. Um, last year, His Eminence Garchen Rinpoche, one of our great Rinpoches, um, 
was teaching um, from his personal experience, which um, we don't um, really do in our lineage um, in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. More, more often we teach specifically from texts. And um, he was saying that um, he could see that his incarceration and torture could be traced back to attraction and aversion. And that the unwinding of his karma could be traced back to not responding to attraction and aversion, a like dislike. He could see how his karma arose and how not to create new karma even though he was in a horrific situation. And so his path to enlightenment was while he was locked up in a prison and being tortured. And he used that situation to become enlightened. And when I think about um, particularly what we've been talking about today in terms of there is contact from our non-conceptual sense faculties, right? And then there's a response in our mind. And the response in our mind is our conceptual understanding that we build based on very little information. Um, it really helps me understand the truth of this when I think about his experience in prison because he was chained up next to his um, specific teacher and across from them was an even more advanced master. So his specific teacher, the advanced master, and His Eminence Garchin Rinpoche were having more or less the same set of circumstances, right? Mm -hmm. They're in the same jail, more or less getting the same food. Uh, they were all chained up. So Garchin Rinpoche started as an angry young man. The master, the teacher that was next to him, helped him see, okay, your path as a spiritually engaged being in this context, in this situation, is to not create new karma and to generate loving kindness. It's not that terrible things were not happening, terrible things were happening, but he was watching his own mind as his spiritual practice. He could have used that time to get angrier and angrier. So we know from stories from jail that there are all kinds of people who are fighting over a piece of bread. You know, that sense of the I and I need this and I deserve this more than um, the person next to me is a survival response that many of us would have. Yeah? He took the situation as a spiritually engaged being, and I'm sure it was extremely difficult to look at like just like a neutral, not going into anger and aversion um, or desire. And he said if there was one thing after all of these 80 years that he could leave with us is to really look at anger and aversion and attachment and desire. This fleeting feeling that becomes I want this or I don't want this. I like this a lot or I don't like this very much. I have to have this. Um, or get me out of here. That fleeting becomes all of those larger and larger things which become hatred. He didn't, in this particular teaching, say anything about the great master who was next to him, but he said um, what he thought was interesting was the profound master across from him. The profound master across from him um, wasn't suffering at all. Um, 
you know, how far has he gotten into Buddhahood and self and other? I don't know exactly. Um, it seems like when he died, um, he was a Buddha, the, the master across from them. So what the master across from them was, not only did he have no um, um, aversion going on to the jail and being tortured, um, he just would walk out every day and go to the market. Um, and so, because he totally understood that the world he was recreating was his mind, the chains couldn't keep him tied to the wall. And so the guards would get more and more upset with him, and <laughs> they'd tie him tighter and tighter and tighter. And uh, Rimshay said, he, he know this is true because he was told this by the guard after the man died, um, and the guard wasn't Buddhist and you know wasn't supportive. He said that they tied him so tightly that the the ropes went into his body, um, into his flesh, um, and he still would go in and out every day. And then when he died, um, he died tied up, and uh, left relics, and the relics were embedded in the rope. So his mind was totally free. All phenomena are preceded by the mind, issue forth from the mind, and consist of the mind. Same circumstance. Many people responded to it in many different ways. And um, Rubiche freely admits he had a terrible ten temper before he went to jail. <laughs> Hard to imagine, but he does say that. And he came out so irresistibly, lo irresistibly loving that no one can resist um, being joyful around him. He also came out fearless. If there's no self and no other, there's nothing to fear. So they would talk about him um, uh, riding along the road in Tibet and um, some person being really angry and running after the car with a gun. And um, he said to the driver, um, oh, slow down. And he invited the, um, the man with the gun to sit next to him. And I think about this a lot because most people would say, drive faster. <laughs> but if there is no self and no other, that means there's no self-absorption, which means you see a suffering being and you think, not how can I help because there's no I, but help. My heart is open to you, or, or heart is open to you, without an I or a my. So these stories, um, I find them really helpful because it's, it's wonderful to know someone in your experience has taken the teachings, tested the teachings, worked with the teachings. So when the situation is so difficult, um, they have a, a, a response that we can aspire to. So often um, we have the teachings and then some drastic things happens to us and we, we lose our spiritual perspective. It's not because our spiritual perspective can't be effective, it's that we aren't strong enough yet in our spiritual perspective to allow it to be effective. And that's why we continually test each little bit of the practice and test these philosophical tenets to see what part of this can I understand, what part of this is true. What part can I have um, an experiential understanding in my own mind so that I have certainty about a little piece of it? And every time you get a little piece of certainty, that's something that you can stand on and um, affirm and work with both your own suffering and the suffering of others. So when you sit with something that's extremely difficult for you and you unpeel your skin like a snake, 
over and over, this makes me angry. This makes me so angry, I can't think about this without being angry. But let me question this. This is a thought. This is not a present moment. This is ephemeral thought. Do I have to choose this right now? Till you get to the point where you convince yourself you don't have to choose it. Till you get to the point where you can say, okay, I do have a choice. I don't have to continue replaying this over and over. And then you learn moment by moment how to make a different choice. Then your friend comes to you who is broken hearted and you can say, honey, it's not permanent. I'll sit beside you. There's going to be a break in the pain. Let's look at it this way. Let's look at it this way. And then you can be a benefit to others. This is the thing that I think is so important and so beautiful about Buddhism. Um, I was saying the other night that I contemplate the stories of um, many different kinds of stories, and I, I like seeing them from different perspectives and in different, different years, different times. I see wholly new things in the story. So one of the stories uh, that I was com contemplating this year was the story of um, Pat Kara, one of the early Buddhist nuns. And uh, she had extraordinary tragedies, you know, an hour's worth of story of tragedy. Her husband died, her children died, her parents died, and uh, it was all within a very short amount of time, and she went crazy. The part of the story I'm interested in right now is um, she goes mad from the pain. And we can appreciate this. There are human tragedies all the time, and we've experienced pain to the point where sometimes we feel like we can't get out of it and feel mad. So she, she finally gets to the Buddha, um, and we can think of um, His Eminence Garchen Rinpoche in place of the Buddha, this loving being, um, saying to her, Sister, I can't help you. You have to do this yourself. It's not that he left her without help. He admitted her to the Sangha. He gave her teachings. But he was directly honest with her after he comforted her, you know, after they put a robe around her. But he said, I can't give you a change in your mind. Mm -hmm. You have to do it yourself. I can tell you all the helpful things I learned. I can sit with you and give you a community of people who are equally committed to unwinding their ignorance and seeing through samsara. And together we can create circumstances that will be in every way that we can assist you, but you have to do it. And I thought, at first I thought that line was so shocking that I looked at a bunch of different translations to see, you know, if somebody was being overly dramatic. <laughs> but no, it was fairly, a fairly consistent um, uh, interpretation. And then when we were studying with His Holiness Chetsang Rinpoche um, this year, and he was going into nature of mind teachings, it was, it was a wonderful setting, and he is um, my, um, who I think of as my root teacher. And um, I have an extraordinary devotion to him, and um, great faith in his capacity. Uh, but he was sitting there, and he was saying, everybody wants to see the nature of their mind. I can't give it to you. You have to do it. He can, he can give us hints, he can give us practices, he can give us teachings that we can apply, but we have to do it ourselves. But every time we make a little bit of headway, we know how to benefit all sentient beings who also have human minds, who also are in the same confused samsara. And what I think is really wonderful to hear um, 
in each of these situations, it was that a human being just like us went step by step to clear seeing the nature of their mind, um, clear seeing the nature of reality, clear seeing um, the elaborations and fabrications that become so confusing and that are unnecessary and can be dropped aside. Okay, I think we'll do a little more meditation.